Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MIF++ seminar. So in this uh, session, uh, last time before the summer break, Tony Nixon from Lancaster University will talk about quotient graphs of symmetrically rigid frameworks. Uh, over to you, Tony, please. Okay. Thank you, Vitaly. It's a pleasure to come and give the talk, even if it's um, on Zoom. So yes, as you said, I'm going to talk about quotient graphs of symmetrically rigid frameworks. So this is a title of a, a paper of mine that we worked on maybe three years ago, and it was published recently. Um, it's joint work with the people you can see on the screen, Sean Dewar, Georg Raska, and Left Harris Castus, who were all postdocs with me at the Fields Institute at the time when we had a, a special semester on rigidity and related topics. Um, so I decided that I, I'm going to spend about half of the talk before I get to the content of the paper. So it's going to be hopefully quite elementary, the start, but please do interrupt if I don't make things clear. I, I want to basically give you some intuition, at least for the whole area of rigidity theory of geometric rigidity before we get to the more complicated stuff with symmetry and quotient graphs in there. Okay, so, and sorry, I need to minimize the pictures of people so I can see uh, that one. There we go. Okay, so this is the, the very basic setup. So we have um, a framework as our basic object. So you start with a, a graph, so a finite simple graph or a network. And what I want to do is realize this network as a physical object. So we have a, a framework, which was a pair G comma P, so it consists of our graph and a map P, which assigns positions to the vertices. So let's jump down to the bottom, to the bottom left and look at the, this example. So a simple example would be, I take the graph to be a four cycle and I realize the four vertices in R2 to live at 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 to make it a unit square. And then I think of that as a physical object. So what I mean by that is I have the vertices have full rotational freedom. The edges have become particular lengths, in this case, length one, line segments of uh, fixed length one, so they can't break. I can't move two edges apart. They, if they meet at a vertex, they have to continue to be at that vertex at all points, but the vertex can move freely otherwise in the space. So you start with, if you start with your four vertices with no edges, you can imagine that each of the four vertices in the plane has two degrees of freedom. It can move independently, however it likes in the plane. Those eight degrees of freedom for the four vertices, the edges are the things I'm going to use to try and rule out as many of those degrees of freedom as I can and think about rigidity as being when the only degrees of freedom left are the, the trivial ones that come from translations and rotations. So the rigidity question roughly is when do the lengths locally determine the shape? So for example, just before I come to the four cycle, let's think about a triangle. If I take a graph to be the free cycle or a complete graph from three vertices, and I put the three vertices down, let's say as an equilateral triangle, then the three side lengths determine the angles, they determine the area. The only thing I can do to change that shape is translate it, rotate it, or reflect it. And they're, they're what I mean is this sort of trivial isometry is that we can ignore. So the triangle is nicely rigid, the four cycle, as you can see at the bottom, is not rigid. So what's happening here, you can see, to, to make it hopefully a bit easier to see, I've, I've translated the, the second version of the four cycle across. But what you should think of as is the, the bottom two vertices is fixed and the edge between them is fixed. And then the other two vertices are sort of continuously flopping over and, and flattening down. So if we're moving from a square, changing the angles, changing the distance from the on the diagonal from this long distance continuously down until it's very short. So more slightly more mathematically, but still informal, the framework is continuously rigid if every edge length preserving continuous motion of the vertices arises from an isometry. So again, the graph is fixed, the edge lengths are fixed, and I'm not allowed to just translate or rotate. I have to, can I find some way to continuously change the shape of the object within the space my framework lives? If I can, then it's flexible. If I can't find any such thing, then it's rigid. Okay, so before we go into any, no? Yeah, before we go in into any any of the mathematics, I thought I'd just put a few motivating pictures up from several application areas that, and, and I know there are applications in things in crystallography and chemistry more related to what 
your your group does, but these ones are the the ones I've been nearest to it in in my research in the past. So the first one is um, control theory and engineering. So you can imagine you have a collection of autonomous robots that move around in some space, and the control theorists want the the result of their control law to be a rigid formation. So for example, you can imagine you have a, a leader robot who just can move freely within the, the plane, let's say, or free space, whatever you like. And then there are some follower robots who sense the distance to the leader. And if, if it makes a sort of rigid formation, then they can nicely move around in the space in some way. So it, the, I'm not giving any particular details or just trying to give a, a hint as to these applications. So the second one is to materials such as graphene and silica bilayers. So this is um, so biophysicists were interested in how to understand um, the floppy modes and the energy landscape in these this kind of materials. And so we could use some rigidity theoretic tools to understand what was was going on. I mentioned just before the start to, of the talk to Vitaly about um, some work I'm doing at the moment into genome reconstruction using rigidity theory. And so the idea here is again to understand the energy landscape and understand rigid and flexible regions within biological things. So within cells and looking at the backbone within a cell or looking at between cell connections. I don't understand these pictures, so let me not say anything more about that. And then as what might look like a somewhat random one, but I'm putting it in there to sort of show you the, the breadth of how where rigidity can be applied is um, probably you know that there is this topic of collaborative filtering where you look at Amazon or Netflix, so these recommender systems where they, you from you what you've watched, say on Netflix, it recommends to you new sh new shows or new movies to watch. And the idea behind it is you they have partial information, so you can think of it as a a low rank matrix completion question where you have some number of the entries of a matrix, and you're told that there's sort of heuristics of why people's behavior in this regard says that the matrix should complete to some specified low rank, and then can you complete it in a unique way, or is, are there infinitely many ways to complete the matrix subject to that rank condition? And it turns out that you can translate this into a, a very nice rigidity problem. It's about um, inner product distance and spherical framework, so it's slightly different to what I'm doing today, but I think it's a nice application area of rigidity. So back to, to mathematics and to some of the, the basic ideas. So first of all, let's talk about the, the one-dimensional case. Suppose we just live on the real line. Then it should be relatively easy if you, you think to your yourself for a, a minute that if your graph is connected, there's no way, nothing you can do. So you can translate the entire framework along the line, but the dis distances are fixed. So between any two vertices, there's some path of edge lines that has to be fixed. If you move one along, the other one will have to follow at that same rate, and it will just be a translation. And conversely, if your graph is disconnected, then you have at least two connected components. You can have one component that's completely fixed, and the other component can slide along the line. And so this is clearly a way of having a, a continuous motion. It's a locally a translation to one component, but it's not globally a translation, so it's a, a non-trivial deformation. So rigidity on the line is exactly the same as the graph being connected. This is because the line is very special and very simple. And in particular, notice that on the right-hand side of the if and only, if we only had the graph. So on the left-hand side, you had two bits of information, the graph and the realization P, you had the framework, whereas on the right, you only had the graph. For D at least two, when you're asking about the framework being rigid in R2 or RD, it's um, it's not true anymore, and it depends both on G and P, and this makes it a big computational challenge to determine rigidity for a given framework. So the a simple example would be in the first slide, I met, talked about a triangle and about a four cycle, a triangle and a square. If you take the graph to be the four cycle and you choose for two vertices that are adjacent, choose a map P, which puts those two vertices in exactly the same place then that tells you between those two vertices, there is an edge of zero length. So your four cycle behaves exactly like a triangle. So I said a four cycle was flexible when I realized it as a unit square, 
I could choose to realize it in a way that makes it rigid. So the answer to the question, is the framework rigid, depends on the P as well as the G. Okay. But I don't like that, to be honest. And I want this top, if and only if, to be true with some nice graph theoretic property on the right-hand side, if we say framework is rigid in RD. So that motivates us just to put a condition on the, the realization P, which allows us to, to talk about graph rigidity rather than framework rigidity. And it would take us a couple of slides to see why this is the right condition. But you, we say that a framework is generic if the set of coordinates is algebraically independent over the rationals. So roughly speaking, this is the definition an algebraic geometer would give you to say that we're going to take a generic point on a variety and look at that behavior and it's nice and well behaved. If you don't like algebraic geometry or algebraic independence, then the way to think of it is to think of, to say that I'm taking my map P from the vertex set into RD to be random. And then with probability close to one, you'll get the same answer as I, I will get for a generic framework. So I, I'm looking at the, the probabilistically typical behavior, just I'm doing it in an algebraic way to make the, the proofs I want to do work out. Okay. So then for my framework, I'd said we fixed the edge lengths. The way that's done is by a, what I call a measurement map, FG, which takes R to the D times the number of vertices into R to the number of edges. And it's simply defined by putting a list of the Euclidean squared edge length. So we square to get rid of the square roots, and we just take the Euclidean distance between the positions of vertex i and vertex j in the framework gp and then this is just a list of for all of real numbers for all the edges okay and so if you like you can think about rigidity as being the understanding the configuration space so we look at f inverse fg of p so we look at the set of all vectors q in r dv such that the framework gq has all the same edge lengths all the same numbers when you apply the f map as gp did and translations and rotations, and if you like, we can quotient out by those and look at the, the, the configuration space, moduli the Lie group of isometries, and, and talk about what the dimension of this space is to understand rigidity. But I'm going to do it in a, a little bit more simple-minded way on the, the next slide. Tony, could I ask a question here? Sure. Uh, the indices ij, uh, are they for vertices or for edges? Okay, so, yes, so so sorry, so I and J are vertices, I, J is an edge. Oh, I see, so that, that's a pair. Yes, so so, uh -huh. so this this list with the dots is for every single edge, you have an entry, but the entries look like this one does. Mm -hmm. So this is vertex I, and the P map gives you the position in RD of vertex I and the position in RD of vertex J. So this is just a vector subtraction, and then you take the, the Euclidean, uh, norm squared of this. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, what happens if you say swap uh, labels of two vertices? Say vertices one and two, and we swap the labels. Um, will this map change? Well, so, so the, the, this map would change because the list is depending on some particular ordering, but I I don't care what the the ordering is. Mm -hmm. So in the the graph I start with, you would be changing the, the labels on the vertices of the graph, but it would, wouldn't you wouldn't change the graph up to isomorphism. So it, it wouldn't change any of the the dimension counting or the, the things I'm going to do to it. Okay. So it would change it, but not in an important way, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so yes, so we have this map that tells us the edge lengths. And then what I want to do is determine rigidity as a a matrix or a matroid theoretic concept, but I don't want to go into matroid theory today, so don't worry if you're not familiar with it. And the idea is you take this map, it's, um, I said it was square distances, so it's quadratic, everything's quadratic. So if I take the Jacobian of it, I'll get nice linear objects. And so let me jump to the, the third bullet point and I'll go back up. So the rigidity matrix has a row for every edge, and it has D columns for every vertex. And a typical row has lots and lots of zeros. So all the dots are zeros. The only non-zero entries are in the D tuple of columns corresponding to vertex I and the D tuple of columns corresponding to vertex J. Sorry, this is for the row from vertex VI to VJ. So PI, I've changed the notation slightly. I apologize from the previous slide. 
So PI is the position of vertex VI and PJ is the position of vertex VJ. So in the D-tuple of columns for vertex VI, in the row for the edge from VI to VJ, I have this vector difference and then the negative, negative of it under the, the D-tuple of columns for vertex J. So an edge gives you a row. The row has 2D potential non-zero entries and they have this particular form. So it's a, a nice sparse structured matrix. And really, this is the Jacobian of the map I had in the previous slide, except as you, you know that the Jacobian, there was lots of quadratics. So the two, the powers of twos come down. And so there's a scalar of two missing that I've just discarded. In different words, the rigidity matrix is the matrix of coefficients of the linear system in the bullet point above. So we can think of, in, just like we were thinking of continuous motions of moving the framework around, we can think of doing that on an instantaneous or in, infinitesimal level. So we can think of an infinitesimal motion as a map, from again, from the vertex set to RD, I'm calling the map U, which satisfies this dot product condition. So again, for every edge of the framework, the vector difference of PJ minus PI for the edge VJ, VI should be orthogonal to this this vector difference of these infinitesimal motions, it's instantaneous velocities. If you don't like motions, just think about, we get this nice matrix, we, we really care about the properties of the matrix. In particular, the framework, we, let's say, just for basically for one slide, is infinitesimally rigid if one of two things happens. Either it's very small. So we're going to think of the dimension as being basic, is, is a very small number, like two, three, four. So if the number of vertices is tiny, then the rank of the rigidity matrix should be the number of edges in a complete graph on n vertices. So if you're very, very small, we want the graph to be complete, basically. Or if n is at least d plus one, then this is the, the typical case, the important case, then the rigidity matrix should have this rank. So this is D times the number of vertices. So that's the number of columns we had in our matrix minus D plus one choose two. So D plus one choose two is the dimension of the Euclidean isometry group, which has D translations and D choose two rotations. And these vectors in here are always in the kernel of this matrix. If you can, it's not so hard to get it from just the, the structure of it, that if you translate the PI and PJ will both translate by the same amount, so it will cancel in the minus, et cetera. So these things are always in the kernel. And if you like, it's infinitesimally rigid, this rank condition, or it's equivalent, it's infinitesimally rigid if the only infinitesimal motions are the maps that are restrictions of the Euclidean isometry. So the U would be an infinitesimal isometry, infinitesimal translation or rotation. Okay, so a couple of examples. Um, so firstly, let's look at this K4. So complete graphs are always rigid, but this vertex of degree one is free to rotate freely centered at that neighbor. So this is a clear example of a, a flexible framework. You can put your, if you want to do it infinitesimally, you can put U as zero everywhere else and just have a, a rotation applying around here. So this is easy. The same number of edges, except I take one out of the K4 and put it over here, shows a nice example of a rigid framework. And these are the sort of the easy rigid frameworks in two dimensions. Start with a triangle and recursively add vertices of degree two. You can build up complicated graphs, but all very easy to see. One by one, you add degree two as you get rigidity is quite straightforward. The idea would be that this vertex moved on a circle centered here. And if it has a second neighbor, it also moves on a circle centered at its other neighbor. And those two circles will generically intersect in finite number of positions. So you, you can't move from one to the other continuously. The ones that the examples at the bottom are harder examples to see. Um, so I think I won't say anything more about them, but this is just to show you that you can get more complicated examples, even on very small numbers of vertices. Tony, could I ask about the top right picture? Yes. Uh, if, if with extra vertex um, number five has say, um, Twice, uh, twice shorter edges to uh, the two fixed vertices. Then can we have uh, two mirror images 
So I, I'm not sure if I understood your question, but what I can definitely do is you can think of these two vertices as you can put a line, a mirror line through there and you can reflect yeah. this vertex over here. Uh -huh. yes. So that, that gives you a different way of drawing your, your structure. Uh -huh. But the, because we're thinking about our frame as living in two dimensional space, there's mm -hmm. no way to move from where it is here to that other realization in a continuous way. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. continue, continuity was important mm -hmm. to the definition of rigidity. Okay. You can have a different version of rigidity, which is known as global rigidity. And this framework would not be globally rigid for exactly the reason I think you, you suggested from this flip over. So this is rigid, but not globally rigid in that sense. Uh -huh. uh, and, and the simple example, when you have three points on, on a straight line, uh, is, it, uh, is it not uh, continuously rigid? So um, if you're entire, you're thinking in two dimensions and your entire graph is three points on a line with two edges, so like a short path. Uh -huh. So this is very flexible for the same reason that this degree one vertex here is. Yeah, yeah, but you, um, you, you, what you could do is you could make your free vertex graph into a triangle and have an entire collinear triangle. So you have path of length two that you had and then one more edge yes, around. Yeah, yeah, I meant that. Mm -hmm. Degenerate triangle. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so this one is rigid because you can't deform it continuously. The fact that it's a triangle forces it to stay, mm -hmm. the three points to stay collinear at all times and the edge lengths determine that exact triangle is what you have, but it's not infinitesimally rigid mm -hmm. because by the definition I had here, I can choose my U's so that the vertex in the middle, if you have your three vertices, the two on the outside, you put your U component is zero and the other one, you put it directly orthogonal to the, mm -hmm. to the line the free edges define. And then this dot product condition will be satisfied. The orthogonality mm -hmm. condition will work. And in terms of the matrix, what that's saying is that the, the rank of the rigidity matrix will be one less. Those three rows will be dependent rather than independent in the matrix, mm -hmm. because any two of them, you'll be able to express the third row in terms of those two because of that collinearity, the degeneracy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Okay. So let's continue on. So... So, yeah, so this is what I was saying about the use of the word generic. So in the 70s, Asimov and Roth proved that in the generic case, in any dimension, rigidity, as I described it in terms of continuous rigidity, is equivalent to the infinitesimal rigidity in terms of infinitesimal motions or the rigidity matrix. So either so you're rigid if and only if you're either a small complete graph or the rank of the rigidity matrix is exactly what it should be, this dv minus d plus one choose two. And so maximizing the rank of a matrix is a nice generic property. So it follows that we can say a graph is rigid in RD if there is some generic framework GP of that graph G, which has a full rank rigidity matrix. So just like in one dimension, we can talk about a graph being rigid. So in one dimension, it was a graph was rigid if and only if it's connected. In D dimensions, it's a graph is rigid if and only if the rigidity matrix has full rank. And so we would like to improve on that and express it combinatorially the same way we can express it in one dimension in terms of just purely graph properties rather than this matrix rank condition. The point there is that while it's a nice characterization and there are nice algorithms for matrix rank, and it's even a sparse matrix, so there's even better algorithms for matrix rank, it only applies in the generic case. So the entries in the matrix effectively have to be treated symbolically. So you're talking about the matrix rank of indeterminates. So it's you only get a nice fast algorithm in the randomized case where we can say put say integer entries in and get the answer with reasonable probability. So in two dimensions, actually significantly earlier, but although I'm, I'm using in my presentation of it what's at the top, but Polachek Geringer went further and in two dimensions showed you can have a nice graph condition. So to do that, I need to give you a definition. So but this is more general than we need for her result, but we're going to come back and use it again later. So a graph or even a multi-graph with loops and parallel edges potentially, I'm going to call it KL tight if the number of edges is equal to k times the number of vertices minus l. So you have this nice linear relationship between edges and vertices in your graph, but also you don't ever violate that amount in any subgraph. So in any subgraph with v prime vertices and e prime edges, you have at most k times v prime minus l edges. As long as your subgraph doesn't have 
less than k vertices. You, we know only check ones with at least k vertices. So that's what I mean by non-trivial. Okay. So when I plug in k equals two and l equals three, this is the dv minus d plus one choose two for two dimensions. I've just written out again, you get e is two b minus three, and you have corresponding hereditary subgraph inequality. And then there's two pictures here that both achieve this count for six vertices. Well, the one on the left is rigid, the one on the right is not. The point is that while at the same number of edges, the k4 is wasting one of the edges, and so the k4 violates this, this count by one, because two times four minus three is five, not six. And the fact there's one too many in this k4, and you have the total count, says there's one too few somewhere else. And there is the one too few is over here in this four cycle, which moves the same way that the four cycle itself did on the first slide. So Polachek Geringer proved that a graph is rigid if and only if you have this nice condition, except there's one thing I omitted, which maybe is obvious, is that this, say you take this nice rigid graph, if you add an edge to a rigid graph, it's clearly still rigid. <clears throat> so we can keep adding as many edges as we want. So this condition tells you a total number of edges for the condition to hold. And if I add an edge to it, that will then be violated. So the condition really in the theorem is contains a spanning subgraph, which has this two free tight condition. <clears throat> And this gives you a nice condition you can check by network flow algorithms very efficiently at, at, at big scale. Okay, But unfortunately, in D dimensions, we can't say very much. So what we can say, and he didn't express it in this language, but Maxwell's study of frames in the 1860s gives you that the necessary condition holds. So if you're rigid, the rank of the rigidity matrix has to be the full rank, and that tells you the number of edges should be the right thing for um, some spanning subgraph to be d comma d plus one choose too tight. But the converse, the interesting part of polychek geringers theorem doesn't work in any higher dimension. And maybe I'll skip this for, for time reasons, but giving a combinatorial understanding. So saying, given one of these graphs, what extra conditions I need to impose to guarantee rigidity is really the, the central open problem for rigidity theory since polychek Geringer's result in the 1920s. So for a hundred years now, it's been a um, substantial open problem. Okay, so now I want to introduce the symmetric variant of what's going on. So we were talking about generic frameworks or taking a random realization of a, an arbitrary graph. So now I want to, to focus in on, on symmetry. And so I think, as you know, in things like crystallography, there's quite a interest in symmetry, so fullerenes and the symmetry of these objects um, is nice. So hopefully there is some nice crossover. So I start with a graph, but I can't take an arbitrary graph. I want to take one which satisfies some non-trivial automorphism group. So there's some abstract symmetry of my graph. And then I want to turn that abstract symmetry via some representation into a, a geometric symmetry, into a rotation group or a reflection group or something like this, a, um, some symmetry group acting on, on some object in Euclidean space. And as well as the graph having the, the um, abstract symmetry, the framework, the P should be chosen to realize it as a framework with the corresponding physical symmetry going on, okay? So then there are two distinct questions we can, can ask. One is incidental symmetry, which I'm not going to focus on today. That would be my graph has some symmetry. The framework is realized with this symmetry. And then I ask the rigidity question exactly as I've done for the last half hour. So it just happened to be symmetric, but we still ask the normal rigidity question. The one I want to focus on is the variant called force symmetry. In this one, the graph has a symmetry. The framework has a symmetry. But there is some external force from, from the application area that says the only motions you're allowed are symmetric motions. So somehow I, I talk about a framework and then I think about can it move? And I was allowing any movements before, but in force symmetry, I'm only allowing movements that preserve the symmetry group. So I'm going to have a continuous family of 
flexors or motions of a framework, they all have to have the same symmetry as the starting one. So if you try and break the symmetry, that's disallowed by the, the model. And so we're only interested in, in motions that preserve the symmetry as we go. Okay. If you're interested in symmetric rigidity, my recommendation is this book by Bob Connolly and Simon Guests called Frameworks, Tensegrities and Symmetry from a couple of years ago. So they have a a huge wealth of information about this this area of geometric rigidity. So Guest is an engineer and Connolly's a mathematician. So there's a nice applied flavor to this book as well as theoretical stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna ha I have a few slides which are in some sense a repeat of stuff you you learned um, in this seminar series a few weeks ago by um, Gregory McComb, I think his name was. Um, the he called them voltage graphs in the rigidity literature for the last decade at least they've been called gain graphs but it's the same idea so what happens so first of all think about the the four cycle on the left so here i'm thinking of this graph as having a twofold rotational symmetry a half turn automorphism group mapping a1 to a2 and b1 to b2 so there is an orbit of vertices a1 and a2 and an orbit b1 and b2 I've picked the symmetry group I want to work with. So in some cases, you might have a, a graph with more symmetries than the one I'm interested in. For example, I could have realized this four cycle with fourfold symmetry, but I'm not. I'm just choosing in this case to realize it with twofold. And then I take the quotient of this graph by the symmetry. So A1 and A2 become the same vertex. B1 and B2 become the same vertex. So that gives me my A and B. More importantly for the, the talk, we start on the right-hand side. And what I'm going to start with is a directed multigraph where the group, the edges are labeled by elements of the group. So when I have the edge A to B, the vertical one, I haven't put a direction on because the, the group label is the identity. So I've just been lazy and not drawn identities on. And so if you reverse the orientation, you take the inverse of the element in the group. So I don't need to bother with the orientation on the identity in any of my groups. Um, but moving from the right to the left, I'll take it because the group is, I'm using the Schoenflies notation here. So the C2 is the element of the group that's not the identity, order two group that's not the identity. And I'm going to use it as a half turn um, in my geometric correspondence. Although this picture on the left, you should think of as abstract because I'm not doing the geometric thing at this point. So I move from A to having order of the group copies of A's in an orbit. So A1, A2, and B to B1 and B2. A to B with the identity says that the representatives go to each, each of A goes to the representative of B, so that's A1 to B1. And correspondingly, the other elements go A2 to B2. The half turn element says the edge from A to B with half turn maps A1 not to B1, but because of the C2, it maps A1 to B2 and it maps A2 to B1. So that gives me my covering graph on the left of the gain graph or voltage graph on the right. Similar, another example, just quickly. So if I start on the right, I have a triangle ABC. I'm gonna use them the same group again, half, half turn rotation. So ABC with three identity edges gives me two copies of the triangle, one on A1, B1, C1, and one on A2, B2, C2. And then the loop on A has C2, so that means it sends copy of A to the next one along, so it sends A1 to A2. Loop on B sends B1 to B2, and loop on C sends C1 to C2. Okay, so in words, but I'll go very quickly, we start with a directed multigraph. For us, we're going to have a gain map which assigns to each edge an element of the group. And importantly for later, we are going to insist that in our definition of gain map, loops must receive a non-identity element. Because if we think of it back here, if it was the identity on A, then A1 would have had an edge to itself. So it would have had a loop on A1. But in a rigidity context, I want my edges to be constraints between vertices. So having a, a loop on vertex one imposes no constraint. And in the same way, parallel edges must receive distinct group elements. This is my way of, in the, the covering graph, forcing it to, be, it to be a simple graph. I don't want to have two parallel edges being the same pair of vertices because it's the same constraint twice, and hence it's no extra information. It's not useful for me. 
So loops receive non-identity group elements and parallel edges receive distinct elements. Then the pair G phi is a gain graph or a voltage graph. And we get the covering graph in the way I said. So we take our gain graph times it by the group. So we have our vertices are elements V comma gamma V for each element gamma of the group. And then our edges are pairs of those things. So if we have a vertex V gamma, V gamma V and a vertex W gamma W, then those two give you an edge. If and only if there exists an edge in the gain graph starting at V directed to W, which has the right product of the, the gains in it, or the right group composition here of the, the gains on those, on those edges. Sorry, the gains for those vertices. Okay, so that gives us our gain and covering graph, which we learned about a couple of weeks ago, and hopefully I haven't butchered what was said. And then we want to think about it as a, a framework. So we have our placement P of the covering graph, and we say that the, any placement, we take like any placement, but we say that that placement we give is gamma symmetric if it satisfies this condition. So this condition says that in our vertices in the covering graph are V comma gamma for each gamma in the group. What we want is that if I position the one with the identity in some place, V comma one, and then I position V comma gamma, it must be true that applying the geometric symmetry gamma to, to P of V comma one gives me P of V comma gamma. So we apply, applying the symmetry takes us around and the, the framework is symmetric as well. And so if we have such a placement, then the pair is gamma symmetric framework for our group gamma. And I've been careful not to say what gamma really is because sometimes it will be infinite groups and sometimes it will be finite groups. But here's one more example, a slightly more complicated one. And this time on the left is the, the quotient graph, the gain graph. And this time, rather than using the shown fleas notation, I've just used pi and pi over two minus pi by two for the, the group elements, because I'm thinking about fourfold rotational symmetry in the plane now. But I'm thinking about the picture on the right, not just of being the, the covering graph, but of being a fourfold symmetric realization as a framework of the covering graph in a nice symmetric realization. And then it's, I, I don't think I want to go into why it's true, but this is an example of a, a rigid framework, a, a gamma, a fourfold symmetrically rigid framework. Okay. So we talked about infinitesimal motions before. So they're maps from the vertex set to RD such that this dot product condition holds, or in other words, it lies in the kernel of the rigidity matrix. And we talked about the trivial ones coming from isometries. And that is, the, there exists a skew symmetric matrix T and a translation X, such that our motion is T times the position of the vertex plus X. Okay, it's V comma gamma, but that's because we're in the, the covering graph. But importantly now, the motion U we choose has to be gamma symmetric, which means just like the vertices, when we take the motion at vertex one and times it by the group element, we get the motion at vertex um, V comma gamma. So the moving around in the vertices of the vertices and the motions satisfy, both satisfy the symmetry condition. And we say that the framework is gamma symmetrically rigid if, uh, so this should have said motion, sorry, infinitesimal motion. The framework is gamma symmetrically rigid if every gamma symmetric infinitesimal motion, as I've described up here, has this form of this skew symmetric matrix and vector, which means it comes from translations, rotations, and reflections. Okay. And then the covering graph, so I want to talk about graphs and their rigidity rather than frameworks, is gamma symmetrically rigid if there exists a gamma symmetric framework, i.e. there exists some P, which can place my, my graph G as a framework GP, which is gamma symmetrically rigid. And if not, it's flexible. So it's, it's the same definitions, just with more complication of symmetry as we had at the start of the talk. Okay, so here's, I think, one last example. So this is the same example we had a couple of slides ago, except I've deleted the edge from B to C with whatever, I think it was gain pi. And that's taken out enough from our rigid example to make, again, in the plane with fourfold symmetry, a flexible example. So in dark gray, you see the, the symmetrically symmetric framework of the covering graph of this gain graph. 
And in light gray behind it, you can, I've tried to illustrate the motion. So the motion keeps the square on the outside on the C's fixed, displaces the A's slightly and the B's slightly. So you can imagine this sort of four cycle that's not constraints there, but the sort of four cycle on the B's sort of shrinks in and twists as you go around to give a, a proper motion. And as it's twisting, the A's come in a bit to allow that. <coughs> Okay, so I want to just send, spend a few minutes telling you about some of the results we have. The first one is a, a, a minor result. I'll go straight to the statement of the theorem. Roughly what this is saying is the Maxwell condition I said before. So that is, if I start with something that's symmetrically rigid, so I start with a, a gain graph which is symmetrically rigid, with enough vertices, then it contains some kind of combinatorial object. So the graph G, G phi satisfies some combinatorial condition. I don't think we have time to worry about what this gain type condition is. The triple here is basically what we had before. Before we had D comma D plus one choose two, capital D is the D plus one choose two. The complication is the symmetry adds a third parameter which is defined in the middle bullet point, but it's basically, we look at the Lie group of isometries of the, the dimension we're in, and of I, so of I, ISO RD, but we have to think about the ones which preserve the symmetry. So for example, if we have a rotationally symmetric thing in the plane about some point, if we translate, we're gonna break that rotational symmetry. So that's disallowed. So this ISO gamma and the K gamma being the dimension of that, if that iso gamma is a proper subgroup of the Lie group of isometries typically, and quite often it's the it's just a trivial subgroup. So it's a zero here, it's a dimension zero. But otherwise, let's not worry about this. This result was known in two dimensions um, for finite groups at least, and we extended it to the D dimensions. So let me briefly tell you about one result in the plane, but just to orient you for that. We take out our symmetry group gamma as a finite subgroup of the orthogonal group. If that subgroup was cyclic or odd order dihedral, then Jordan, Kazanitsky, and Tanagawa, independently Malestein and Ferran, and more recently a new different proof technique by Bernstein, all gave nice understandings of these things. But still today, the even order dihedral case remains open, and any group, any subgroup that contains an even order dihedral, <clears throat> like a D4. Um, subgroup. One thing from our proof technique is that we can extend these finite subgroups to infinite subgroups. So for example, um, irrational rotations, say. As partial progress towards the, the difficult case, we can give a statement of this form. So the two zero tight is because this is one of two cases. So in, in two dimensions with symmetry, you either get your dimension of your isometry group will be zero or one. So just to say one of them and let's not worry about the other one. The idea is we start with a graph. This is the, the quotient graph, but I haven't labeled the gains on there. So I'm not taking the voltage graph. I'm just taking the quotient without the group labelings. And then I'm going to say there exists some way of labeling the edges, which makes it rigid. And we can do that in all cases, except for one particular thing we have to avoid. And I think I won't tell you anything about the, the proof of this one, because I want to spend the time I have left on something else. But the let me briefly say about the this no quadruple of parallel edges condition, this is because of classical work in kinematics and mechanisms from the going back to the, the late 19th century. So the, this sort of bottom of mechanism, Dixon 1 and Dixon 2 mechanisms, which you might Google if you want to find more details on. But this sort of well-known exceptions comes in in this one special case where your graph is allowed to have four or more parallel edges between pairs of vertices. Um, Otherwise, we're able to say something for any group with this um, k gamma equals zero condition, which includes dihedral groups. <clears throat> okay, so in higher dimensions, 
again, so this is, I probably should have put this picture a bit earlier, but this is what I was trying to say very briefly. Instead of looking at the gain graph, I've got rid of the labels now. So if you think of all three edges as labeled with the identity, then the covering graph is this graph you see at the top. It's just two disjoint copies of the triangle <clears throat> on the, the representatives of the orbit and their, their copies under the, the C2 action. But if instead, and which one did I do? If instead I take the edge from A to B, direct it from A to B, and put C2 there, so it's the non-identity element of the order two group, then the AC and BC are still identity, so they still look like A1C1, B1C1, but A to B now moves from A1 to B2 instead. So remember, one-dimensional rigidity was about connectivity, and so you can see that the top example is disconnected, the bottom example is connected. So you can see how changing the gains, the group labels on the edges, can change the rigidity properties. So we want to look at quotient graphs rather than gain graphs and use the freedom to be able to choose the gain labels as we want to be able to say some nice results in higher dimensions. And just to give you one example of such a result, I think this is the most interesting one we had. <clears throat> so again, we set it up so that our multigraph is in a particular family. It's a D0 type multigraph, which means we're thinking about groups where they have no symmetric isometries. And then we either take a sufficiently dense subgroup of the orthogonal group, or we take a finite subgroup, which is sufficiently large and has, uh, has sufficiently large order then we can always prove there exists a choice of the gains which makes our framework symmetrically rigid. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so maybe I don't, I, I should stop at 10 two. is that correct? Or oh, five two. it's also okay. Okay, so then, then I will say 60 seconds on the on the proof of this rather than skipping. Okay, so the, the idea is, is that we start with a, a matroidal decomposition of these graphs. So whitely proved, okay, I should say a map graph is a graph in which every connected component has exactly one cycle. So this is a generalization of the idea of a tree, it has no cycles. If you move up to graphs of exactly one cycle, then you think of that they're the map graphs. And a D0 type multigraph is a, exactly decomposes into the edge disjoint union of D of these map graphs. And using this decomposition and the freedom to choose the gains, we could let each of the D map graphs correspond to a coordinate direction. And then we could use some analytic me methods to basically show that we could set up a matrix with the correct zero non-zero pattern that we could understand its rank and have a limiting argument that, that proved that it was sufficiently close to the rigidity matrix that that had the same rank as it in terms of the lower semi-continuity of matrix rank. Okay, and then the, the thing I will do for the last three or four minutes is um, what I think is a nice question is, so I, let's take a finite group now. So if I get, start with a quotient graph, and I'm allowed to choose the labels for the edges. I've got a finite number of choices at each edge. Finite number of edges is a finite number of choices of which labeling I give to get my to create the gain graph from my quotient graph. And so I would like to understand out of all those choices, how many of them are rigid, how many are flexible. So in terms, I'm going to do that in terms of probability. So if I have a, a graph G and a group, group gamma. I'm going to say a gain, a gamma gain map phi of G is a rigid gain assignment if the gain graph or voltage graph I get, G phi, is gamma symmetrically rigid. And then I'm going to define PG gamma, the probability that a random gain map is a rigid gain assignment. Okay, so I, I look at all possible gain assignments, determine which ones are rigid, which ones are flexible, and I pick one at random, which, which one was it? Was it rigid or flexible? So computationally, we could just exhaust for small enough graphs and we could compute the rigid gain assignments. And so here's a couple of slides of pictures of that. So in this slide, we're thinking about 
two dimensions and we've got 90 degree rotation as a group. So this is an order four cyclic group and order four cyclic means these are the right graphs from our necessary condition. And so for example, in the top left, we have nine edges and at each edge, there are four group elements you can choose from. So four to the power nine is 262,144. So you can try this many different gain assignments. Okay, there's a lot of symmetry in what you get. So there's a lot of redundancy, but we checked the rigid matrix rank for this five vertex graph um, and got 96% were rigid. And similarly for all the other percentages, I mean, you can see down here on six vertices, it's already 4 million different ways of putting the gains you can pick from. And similarly in three dimensions, so this time the rigidity matrix is a bit bigger because it's an extra dimension. So the graphs are a little bit smaller to be computationally tractable. And this time we picked a group, which is composed of three copies of C2, C2 cross C2 cross C2, one for each of the three ax coordinate axes, half turn rotation. The relevant class of graphs is now three zero tight. And again, these are the examples. So we're getting sometimes even 100% rigid. So lots and lots of high percentages. So theoretically, we wanted to decide what sort of percentages, what, what, what can actually happen. And in short, because I'm out of time, let me just say that you take a finite group, you can prove that there exists infinitely many graphs, which you can have a almost one, probability of almost one, that you get rigidity. And there also exists in constructions of families, infinite families of graphs for which the probability of rigidity is almost a zero. So we can make it arbitrarily high and we can also make it arbitrarily small. So even though all the examples I showed you were all 96 plus percent, you can achieve the other extreme. You can get the probability down as low as you want. So it's a zoo of what can happen from high to low probability. Um, but I think I'm out of time, so I should stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Yes, thank Tony for a nice presentation. I'll stop the recording and